Um, it is, uh, in truth, uh, something that I am very happy to do. I have quoted before uh, Jim Flannery, a line he used about his interest in royalty beginning and ending with Elvis. I thought... <laughs> <laughs> fine line, much more witty than a line I'd craft myself. Um, and in truth, I would be a Republican with a small R. I see a value in heads of state which are elected by citizens. But of course, it's up to every country to choose its own system. And for countries which are friends of Great Britain, and Ireland is a dear and great friend of Great Britain, um, for countries of that ilk, the Queen is a remarkable leader and a superb head of state. I wanted just to use the opportunity of this, of this toast to tell you a short story about the impact of five words and how, in our case, it undid a century of tension. The Queen visited Ireland in May of 2011, which might sound unremarkable to you, but it was the first visit of a serving head of state, British head of state to Ireland, in 100 years. Those 100 years included a rising, a war of independence, a civil war, and 25 years of unremitting violence in Northern Ireland. Security for this visit was through the roof. We actually had your president visiting the week afterwards, and you guys usually take security more seriously than anyone, but this was a whole other level entirely. When the Queen was on the flight, the short 45 minute flight from Britain to Ireland, there were serious people having serious conversations about whether that plane would need to turn around. It didn't. The Queen arrived, and a large part of her programme was what you might call formulaic almost, the standard bearers. She was hosted by our President in the Phoenix Park. She met with our Prime Minister and Taoiseach. She visited Trinity College. We even had a chance to plonk a pint of Guinness in front of her. <laughs> she didn't taste it. I don't think she was allowed, but Prince Philip looked like he wanted to. <laughs> <That's one of them. laughs> Through all of this, the Queen was having a whole series of private conversations, but she hadn't yet made any public remarks. So we were waiting to see. Her first public remarks were going to be in Dublin Castle, the seat of British rule in Ireland for hundreds of years. You couldn't pick a more poignant venue. And you know, the phrase, a nation holds its breath, it's overused, but it had some resonance in this case. And you know, there's so many fine orators in this club. You know, there's lots of ways to start a speech. You can stand up, you can say, ladies and gentlemen, I enjoyed your keynote speaker last year who was introduced by Woody and who then got up and said, of all the introductions he'd received everywhere in the world, the last one by Woody was, without a shadow of a doubt, the most recent. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that. <laughs> I thought that was a great intro. I wrote it down and <laughs> promised I would plagiarise it, but I have <laughs> The Queen could have gone with that one. She didn't. <laughs> the, Queen, the Queen stood up and there was silence in the room. Everyone was waiting to hear her first remarks. And she started her speech with five words. She said, A uchtroin agus a chairde. In Irish or Gaelic, it means president and friends. There was silence in the room and then rapturous applause. Our president could be seen mouthing the word, wow. <laughs> the Queen went on to deliver a masterpiece of an eight minute speech, reflecting on the weight of history between the islands and all the effort that had been put into bringing peace, prosperity, friendship between the islands. But really, it was all about those first five words. At Uchtroin agus a And the humility of speaking in Irish, and the respect it offered for a partnership of equals, meant that from that moment forward, she had the country eating out of her hands. She continued with a remarkable visit. She laid a wreath at the Garden of Remembrance, which is where Irish people go to remember those who fought and died for Irish freedom, usually by fighting Her Majesty's forces. She went to Crow Park, 
home of Ireland's Gaelic Games, where in 1920 on Bloody Sunday, Irish civilians were massacred by British, by British troops in retaliation for the killing of British officers and British agents earlier that day. The following year, the Queen shook the hand of Martin McGuinness, the Deputy First Minister in Northern Ireland, and someone who acknowledged his membership of the IRA, an organisation which killed huge numbers through the Troubles, including in 1979 Lord Mountbatten, the uncle of Prince Philip himself. The Queen hosted Martin McGuinness at Windsor Castle for a state banquet the following year, which was held in honour of our new president, Michael D. Higgins, when he visited. And you know, in Ireland, we talk, based on our own experience, about people who take risks for peace. We talk about it at the UN, at the European Union. I talk about it here with groups like the World Affairs Council or the American Jewish Committee. People who have to set aside their principles, have to set aside some of their principles, certainly set aside cast iron principles, who have to engage, who have to give in on certain things they don't want to give in on, who have to shake the hand of people they prefer not to engage with at all. Well, when the history is written of Ireland and Britain and the history of Northern Ireland, the contribution of the Queen, her gestures, her generosity of spirit, her determination, her brilliant words, will rank amongst the very first level contributions of those who took risks to bring peace to our islands. So it is genuinely a pleasure and honour to ask this Burns Club to join with me in offering a toast to the head of state of our closest neighbour and ally, to the Queen. To the Queen! To the Queen! To the Queen! To the Queen. To the Queen.